Let's start. Where did we stop? Yes, we, we talked quite a bit about Kolmogorov complexity. Um, I already mentioned that this notion of Kolmogorov complexity um, is quite insightful for us. So it helps us learning to understand what randomness means. And randomness is correlated to uh, compression. Huh? The, so, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Let me look. Oh, excuse me. Here, if a file can be compressed, then the content is not random. Because you can only compress files with an inherent structure. If there is no structure, and that basically means randomness, then there is no information there which you can compress. Yeah. And if a file can be compressed, then you know there is some structure, but still there may be some randomness. And now we come to Kolmogorov complexity. Kolmogorov complexity also is about compression. It's actually kind of infinite compression. We do have an infinitely long sequence. Huh? So if, I mean, you can't store it. You wouldn't, it would take you an infinite amount of storage, for example, to store all digits of the number pi. But this does not mean it is impossible to store pi. The information inherent in the number pi can be stored in, in the form of a, a finite program. We talked about this program last time. Uh, I mean, basically what you have to do is you have to develop the Arcus tension into a Taylor series and uh, then write a program that expands this Taylor series to an arbitrary number of terms and then you can uh, output any number of digits of pi. And if you can output any number of digits of pi, then of course the whole information about the number of number pi is stored inside this program. So uh, Kolmogorov complexity is a way of kind of infinite compression of infinitely long sequences. Huh? Um, yeah. Any sequence of random numbers has infinite Kolmogorov complexity. But what is not true is the other direction. If you have a sequence with infinite Kolmogorov complexity, um, then you cannot conclude that this sequence is purely random. I gave you an example last time. Who remembers how, how was this example constructed? An example of a sequence? Robin? You took a random number and inserted the one at every second position. Yes, I mean, I wouldn't say a random number. I took a random sequence. Yeah? A sequence of purely random bits and at every second place I inserted <coughs> a one. Yeah? So I merged two sequences, one purely random sequence and one extremely non-random sequence. And after mixing these two sequences, of course the Kolmogorov complexity still is infinite because for every second bit we can't compute it. Huh? Okay, yeah. So now um, yeah, let's continue talking about compression of random number sequences. I mean, there is a, quite a nice theorem 
Uh, let's look at it. No program can compress any files of at least n bit without loss. Any files, that's the point. Huh? Uh, so, in other words, that means there is no program that compress, that can compress an arbitrary file. And in particular, we cannot compress purely random sequences. Huh? And what's important now is we are now talking about finite files. We are no longer talking about infinitely long sequences. Here we are talking about finite prefixes of sequences or just finite files. Huh? And I came to this theorem when I discovered, uh, I mean I was working on random numbers and uh, then I went, uh, I mean I observed an internet forum about random numbers and there was somebody, it was a person from a company in uh, the United States and these guys they claimed they have a program that can compress arbitrary files which actually is the opposite of this theorem so either this theorem is wrong or this guy was wrong um, and then of course I mean uh, you immediately get the intuition this can't be true it is impossible to write a program that compresses an arbitrary file uh, um, why is this impossible? If you could do this, if we would have such a program, then we could, we would, I could, can immediately conclude that you can compress any file whatsoever, no matter what content it has and no matter how large it is. Take a file of, let's say, 10 gigabyte of size. You could compress it down to one bit. How? How would you do that? So if there is any program that can compress an arbitrary file, maybe just to 99% of its size, if we would have such a program, then we could compress the 10 gigabyte file to one bit. We would compress it and then compress it again. Yeah. We would recursively apply our compression algorithm to the result and to the result, and because the result is an arbitrary file, then we could compress everything down to one bit. Huh? Um, I mean, this is not really a proof, is it? Oh, it's actually almost a proof, because of course one bit cannot store so much information, it is impossible. Huh? Um, but, I mean, there was a serious discussion on this web forum uh, about whether such a program can exist or not. Um, and here is one extremely simple proof uh, of this theorem. I mean, and that's a proof that such a program cannot exist. Huh? Um, let's look at this example. Um, Look, the theorem says no program can compress any file of at least n bit without loss. So now we are looking at files of size of length n. Huh? Here we have the length in this tabular and here we have the bit sequences of length n. I mean of, uh, of length 0 there is exactly one sequence which is the empty file. Uh, we call it epsilon, the empty string. Uh, uh, and there is just one such file. There are two files of length 1, this and this, length 1 bit, we have 2. Of length uh, 2 bit, we have 2 to the power 2, which is 4. And of length uh, 3 bit, we have 2 to the power 3, which is 8, and so on. Okay? Um, now, Look at these files here. We have eight of them. And of course they are all different. So there is information inside these 
strings which makes them different. They are different. No two of these guys are the same. Now, if there would be a program that allows us to compress all these three bit sequences, that would mean the result of the compression is one of these the strings, of course, because they are shorter. And compression means the result is shorter, otherwise it's no compression. Now look, here we have eight files of length three. How many shorter ones do we have all together? Four plus two is six plus one is seven. So it's impossible. It is impossible to compress all of these because here we have eight different, but there we only have seven. And this, I mean, this is universally true, uh, no matter what length we have. Okay, so here comes the proof. Suppose such a program could do it. Then we compress with this program only all files of a length n bit. No longer files. Huh? The compressed files, they are not exceeding the size of n minus 1 bits because they have to be shorter. The number of compressed files from size 0 to n minus 1 bits is uh, yeah, 1, that's here, plus 2, plus 4, plus 8, and so on, up to 2 to the power n minus 1. And this sum I mean, that's a geometric, uh, finite geometric sum. If you apply the formula for um, finite geometric series, then you get this result. There are 2 to the power n minus 1 shorter files. Look, here we have 7 files as compared to the 8 here. Okay, but because there are 2 to the power n files of size n bits, at least two files have to be compressed to the same shorter file. And that means um, we have a, a lossful compression. We lose information during compression and this is not allowed. Okay. Yeah, now let's get into uh, pseudo-random number generators. I mean that's important for for any of these random number applications, we want to generate random numbers on the computer, on our digital computer, and that means deterministic algorithms. And we already saw that it's impossible with a deterministic algorithm to produce real random numbers. Yeah, and, and I mean, we will now go into the details of how we can generate something, let's say, that looks like random numbers. And we will also see that this, what such programs output, can never be truly random. Um, oh yes, and sorry, let me, let me make a side remark now. Um, so maybe um, the mechatronic students here, they get the impression, oh, this is computer science, I'm not interested in this. Huh? Um, maybe you're not so interested, but it's, anyway, it's a part of this lecture. But <laughs> it is important for you anyway. I mean, you're an engineer, you will do simulations, you will use mathematics and so on, and maybe for some applications you need good random numbers. And this is a serious issue. If you, for example, take the built-in random number generator uh, in the, of the C programming language, then you will quite soon detect that this is not at all uh, good, ra good random numbers what you get there. Huh? And then you have the problem, what to do? I mean, you could use a different programming language, you could uh, try to find a package with a better random number generator. But, I mean, you always have to be aware that this never can produce perfect random numbers. 
So, and it is, it actually is a serious issue. For most of the applications, it is not critical. But from time to time, you will have applications where th such a little bit of non randomness uh, can have severe consequences. Meaning that the result of your simulation, for example, can, uh, can be completely wrong due to the non-randomness of these numbers. So now, I mean, we won't go into details. We could actually talk the full semester, four hours, and the next semester only about random numbers. I mean, yes, and, and now I have to make a reference to the literature. There is this book from Donald Knuth. Oh, I should bring it here, uh, maybe next time. Um, he wrote this series of books called The Art of Computer Programming. And, but the title is wrong. I mean, it should be called The Art of Computer Science Mathematics. Yeah? That's actually the, the contents of the book. It's not about programming. Yeah? Um, but it's about mathematics related to algorithms and computer science. And one of these books has the subtitle Semi-Numerical Algorithms. Um, and two-thirds of this book is just about random numbers and how to generate and how to test random numbers. Um, yeah. And he did a really good analysis of uh, random number generation. So if you really want to understand about these tests and also about algorithms, First read this book. It still is a, quite a good reference. Okay, yeah. And also uh, to the mechatronic students. I mean, you will, we will in the future of this semester have chapters where you will be happy about and the computer scientists will not be happy about. For example, the numerics of differential equations. That's quite important for mechatronics and not so much important for computer scientists. But let me tell you that all of these fields are important for everybody. Yeah? And that's the first thing. And the second thing, it will of course be fun for everybody among you. Yeah? Um, and that's, I mean, that's the most important thing in life, uh, to have fun, uh, especially with mathematics. I mean, it's like climbing up a steep hill but once you are on top of the hill, you will be happy and then you will... I mean, that's, that's like all, all the time. When you are on top of the hill, then you are happy for a few minutes and then you think, where is this next even bigger hill I want to climb up? Huh? And you will soon get a chunky and that's my goal to make math, math chunkies out of you. Huh? Um, okay, enough about this. Now let's go. Let's move a few steps up the hill, yeah? and uh, maybe we even reach a little intermediate hill where you really be happy. Now this is the formula that uh, the random number generator of the C language uses. Uh, that's uh, a so-called linear congruence generator. And the formula is quite simple. We start with one initial number, x0. Yeah? You can take any number. Um, and then you recursively apply this formula. xn, the next number, is a times the current number. And this a is a constant. It's just a number. Plus some other constant b. And now if you look at this here, you see this is a, a straight line. So it's very simple. It's, a very, it's, it's almost the simplest thing you could do. It would be even simpler if you would remove the B here. Uh, so it's the, the second simplest uh, thing you can do. But without this modulo M, this wouldn't be random at all. Huh? Um, because the next number is just a linear transformation of a number. So that's even much simpler than what we do in linear algebra because it's one dimensional. Huh? But 
adding this modulo m, this is like you produce something and then you chop it. You take a knife and chop it into many parts huh? at arbitrary positions. So the modulo m, I mean what is modulo m? You divide the result by m and take the remainder as your new u number. That's what modulo m does. Huh? Yeah, maybe we, we do an example on the blackboard with small numbers. Uh, look, here we have, I mean, this wouldn't be so convenient on the blackboard. So why don't we take some numbers? Let's take a equal 2, b equal 3, and m equal 5. Small numbers. And then we take x0 equal to 0. And now we, we produce such a table, um, n, x, n. Okay, so we start with uh, n equal, I mean, yeah, we don't have to write the n here. This is not important. Okay, so x, n, we start with 0, and then we compute xn plus 1 is equal, or oh, xn is equal to 2 times xn minus 1 plus 3 modulo 5. Okay, so we take 2 times 0 is 0 plus 3, modulo 5 is 3. 2 times 3 is 6 plus 3 is 9, modulo 5 is 4. 2 times 4 is 8 plus 3 is 11, modulo 5 is 1. Then we have 2 plus 3 is 5, modulo 5 is 0. Then, yeah, okay, and we're finished. Why are we finished? One period is over. Yeah, one period is over. Why? Because we have the zero again. Huh? <coughs> so you see, now let's look how long is the period? One, two, three, four. The period is four. Now, we could now try to get a longer period with different a and b. We could use a equal 3 and b equal 2, for example. Yeah, let's do it again with these guys here. I mean, these two, that's what we had here. And now let's start with 0, and then we get 2 modulo 5 is 2. 4 plus 3 is 7, modulo 5 is 2 again. Is that true? Let's see. Um, 4 plus 3 is 7, modulo 5 is 2. And here we had... No, sorry, sorry. Yeah, we, we, I have to write down the new formula. xn is equal to 3 times xn minus 1 plus 2, modulo 5. Okay, so 0 plus 2, we get 2. And now we get 3 times 2 is 6, plus 2 is 8, modulo 5 is 3. Okay, 9 plus 2 is 11, modulo 5 is 1. 3 plus 2 is 5, modulo 5 is 0. So we have the same period length. We get a different sequence but the period is the same. I mean, could the period be longer? We could try different numbers. But now let's start try, uh, stop trying and start thinking. If you use A equals 1 and B equals 1, then you have 5. 
Okay, so you, you propose a different scheme. Okay, let's try this. A equal 1, B equal 1, and modulo 5. Okay, so we start with 0, and then, so the formula now is xn minus 1 plus 1. Okay, so we take 1 modulo 5 is 1, and then we have 2 modulo 5 is 2, and then we get 3, 4, 0. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. I mean, to me it doesn't look so perfectly random. Huh? Um, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, that's a nice idea. So the, the general formula would be xn is equal to xn minus 1 plus 1 modulo m. Yeah, that's the formula for a non-random number generator. That's how I would call it. Yeah? But with maximum period. So the period now is m. And actually m is the maximum. The period cannot be longer than m. Why? Why can't you get a period longer than m? With, with this type of generator. Huh? So the module m is fixed. And now you can vary these parameters, A and B. Um, the modulo operation always produces numbers between uh, 0 and m minus 1. Yes, so we have m different possible numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as we reach the same number again, we, uh, we have the period. Yeah. That's the proof. Huh? That's the argument. Okay, did you understand this? Okay, and this argument is even more general. This argument holds for all formulas of the type um, xn is equal to f of xn minus 1 modulo m. No matter which f you use. You can use whatever complicated um, algorithm to compute the next xn. It doesn't need to be a closed form mathematical formula. It can be any but that's important, deterministic algorithm. Huh? Deterministic means if you apply your function to a different input, no, if you apply a function to the same input again, then the result will be the same. That's important, that's deterministic. Huh? I mean, it's actually, I mean, that's uh, basic for all functions. So if it's a mathematical function, then it is deterministic. And uh, then, um, of course, as soon as one input of f appears again, you will have the same output. And if we have m different possible numbers, then the maximum, uh, an upper bound for the period is m. Okay, so you see this uh, modulus m is quite important. So if we, if we compute modulo 5, then what we get is not really perfectly random. Because if the period is uh, 5 or even uh, shorter, uh, then this is far from being random. Okay, and that's why uh, Bruce Schneier, in his famous book 
called Applied Cryptography. There he has a chapter on random numbers. I already mentioned for cryptography, random numbers are very important. Um, and he recommends for producing 32-bit integer numbers, he suggests these three parameters. Huh? Um, and you see, this M is not 5, it's much bigger. 259,200. Um, and from our knowledge now, we immediately see that the period of this linear congruence generator with these parameters can at most be 259,200. And, but um, here we are not talking about bits, we are talking about 32-bit numbers. Huh? We are talking about 32-bit numbers. Um, yeah, now let's, uh, let's look. Um, I mean, 32-bit numbers, if we take just positive numbers, positive integers with no negative uh, integers, then the number of 32-bit numbers is 2 to the power 32. And this is, who knows it? Shall we have a look at it? It's, yeah, it's almost, uh, it's approximately, that's good, 10 to the power 10. And this is... Yeah, okay, this factor 4 is not important. Huh? approximately. Um, yeah, we, I mean we could look at the exact figure. Oops, and now we have 2 to the power 32. Oh, it's 4.3 times 10 to the power 9. Okay, yeah. So still this is approximately 10 power 10. Huh? Um, okay, so this is a, a 9 or, or 10 digit number, but what we have here is only a 6 digit number. Why is this, I mean, when I saw this first I was kind of surprised. I would expect the module to be in the size of this number, at least the order of magnitude. I mean, it doesn't make sense to use a module that's bigger than 2 power 32, because we cannot represent it. And uh, the processor, I mean, if we do this on a 32-bit processor or on a 32-bit arithmetic, then of course we cannot deal with numbers uh, greater than, the, than max int. Huh? But why is this so small? And also these guys, A and B, are quite small. Now suppose you do have a 32-bit arithmetic. There is a really simple basic reason why it doesn't make sense to use really big A, B and M. Excuse me, which, which calculation? Um, oh, I, you, mean, you mean this? Yeah. You mean this whole calculation? If everything is only calculated in 32 bits, uh, those um, uh, results, before you, uh, make it, before you apply the module, shouldn't it exceed the 32 bits? Yeah, right. yes, that's the point. Huh? So, 
already this intermediate result, this is the critical uh, computation. Yeah? A times xn minus 1. Yeah? If this product is bigger than 32 bits, then what happens is something like a modular operation even before you can apply this. Because then uh, many decimal places will be lost after the multiplication. You can't represent the result, that's impossible. Huh? So now, and what happens when you multiply two uh, numbers? If A has 16 bit and B has 16 bit, then the product has 32 bit. So you see, so the, this, the number of digits of A plus the number of digits of B has to be smaller than 32. Okay, so now let's, let's see how many bits has this guy. Um, so we have 10 bit is 1000, 12 bit is 4000. Um, so this is, a, I, I would say this is around 16 bit. Huh? Yeah, maybe it's even 17, something like that. Huh? So yeah, now um, so then all the numbers we produce for all the numbers we produce the the number of bits is less than 18. Huh? Are we, I mean, let's look at it. What is 2 power 18? Yeah, so this is a little bit smaller than 2 power 18, what we had. Huh? Okay, so all, all our xn have less than 18 bit. And then we multiply it with A, and this has um, less than 13 bit. Huh? 2 power 13 is uh, something like 8,000. Oh, sorry. Um, 13, but that's what we wanted. 8192, yeah. So you see, we have 18 bit for xn minus 1 times 13 bit, then the result has less than 18 plus 13 is 31. So you see, I mean, this construction uh, makes sense. It makes sense. And I mean, then adding this doesn't make a big change. Uh, yeah. uh, where is this, the, the n coming from? Is that, uh, you will start with... Uh, this m. The n. n. Oh, that's, uh, look. We start with some initial number. Yeah. It doesn't need to be zero. But, but where is it coming from? Uh, that's a good question and that's very important for all our pseudo-random number generators. This initial number, that's what we call the seed. So when you grow a plant, you need a seed at the beginning and then it will develop and be, uh, uh, grow. And I mean this seed is so important because, look, if I take these coefficients and with the seed zero, we get this sequence. If you use a different seed, you get a different sequence. If you take as a seed 3, we actually get the same sequence, but you start at a different point in the period. I mean, if the period is only 4, like here, 
uh, you would immediately see it's the same sequence just uh, shifted by one. But if the period is 259,000, for example, then you won't immediately see that it's the same sequence. And, I mean, there are random number generators with, with much longer periods. Huh? Um, and, yeah. and also, I mean, yeah, let's look what happens. Let's try this. If we use this generator and we start with 2, because 2 doesn't uh, appear here. Yeah, that's, what would you, what would you expect? You just have to look at this sequence and then you know what happens if you start with 2. The first digit would be 4. So now let's put it here. So we start with, so xn again, we start with 2. And then the next will be 4. Let's see, uh, so the formula now is 2 times xn minus 1 plus 3 modulo 5. Okay. So we get 4 plus 3 is 7, modulo 5 is 2. That's our sequence. I knew it. I knew it before. Even without calculating anything. Just from looking at this sequence, you know that with the initial number 2, with the C2, this is the sequence. Why? Why do you know it from looking at this? <coughs> yeah, because 2 is the only one number which does not appear here. If we would start with 2 and we would get maybe 3 as the next digit, then it would continue like that. But this is impossible. Because then we would have this sequence and the 2 would not appear. I mean, that's, uh, that also gives you the impression that at least this combination of these uh, three numbers is not really perfect. Huh? Because if you take 2 as a seed, that's what you get. And I mean, behind all this arithmetic of these uh, pseudo-random numbers, there is of course a lot of mathematics in order to find such good parameters. Huh? Okay, so it, it's really a business finding such good parameters. Huh? Um, and now, uh, I think the second or third exercise in the exercises here is you implement this formula with exactly these parameters. Huh? And now it's your task to test whether this pseudo-random number generator produces good random numbers. Huh? And that's a very nice exercise because you will then see, my, I mean even though Schneier claims this to be a good pseudo-random number generator, but you will quite soon see that these numbers are not at all random. Huh? Let me give you a small hint. Um, if you just look at the numbers, I mean, if you print out these 32-digit numbers as uh, decimal numbers, as decimal integers, I mean, they're all integers, huh? if you just print them out in a sequence, then this looks quite random on the first side. Only at the first glance this looks quite random. But if you even just look at the numbers in decimal representation, at the second or third glance, you will see structure. But you will see even more structure. You will see a lot of structure if you print out these numbers binary. If you look at the binary representation of these numbers, 
then you will see structure. That's the first uh, thing. And the second, um, now your task is to test this generator. So then think about tests. Now the issue is find a statistical test that as a result tells you is this sequence random or is it not random? Or let's say is it a good random number generator or is it a bad random number generator? I mean this is, this is one of the tasks. Just think about whether these numbers are random or not and think about how could you test this. I mean there are infinitely many chances of constructing such tests for random numbers. Okay, yeah. So much about this uh, generator and now let's look at this theorem. The functional characteristics of a congruence generator leads to the following upper bounds for the period. Look, now we are talking about a congruence generator um, and this is more general. This is a linear congruence generator because the formula here is linear. The congruence generator is this guy. So you use an arbitrary function f here. Yeah, and what we already proved is this. If this is our recursion, recursive scheme, then the period is less than or equal to m. Now the question is, how can we make the period longer? Is there a chance to get a period which is longer than m? I mean, at first glance you might think no. Because we only have m different numbers available, but yes, you can get longer period. For example, if you use such a scheme and now, but now it's important, now our function f depends on two such predecessors. It depends on, look here, I mean what did we do here? We take this number, input it into our formula and then compute the next and so on. Um, and with this scheme, what we now do is we take two previous numbers. So we input these two numbers into our f and from this compute the next and from these two compute the next and so on. This is a new scheme. And why is now m squared an upper bound for the period? Why is the upper bound now m squared? Maybe we should uh, look at an example first that you believe it's true. Huh? Maybe first you need some intuition and then the theory. Now, yeah, let's, let's use the nice and well-known and famous Fibonacci uh, sequence. Who has never heard about the Fibonacci sequence? Okay, I'll tell you now. Yeah? Uh, Fibonacci. <coughs> First, Fibonacci was a, a famous Italian mathematician. Um, he lived a couple of centuries ago. Um, and actually, he didn't invent this sequence, but he made it popular. Huh? Um, and now we use x0 is equal to 1, x1 is equal to 1, and then the recursion xn is equal to xn minus 1 plus xn minus 2. And now we look at the sequence. No, modu no modular operation. We will in a minute um, do it modular. Yeah, why don't we continue here? So the sequence then is 1, 1, 2, 
3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and so on. Every number is the sum of the two predecessors. It's so simple. And this is, I mean, this is really fun uh, playing around with Fibonacci. Uh, just look at Wikipedia and you will find lots of nice examples where in the real world Fibonacci numbers occur. Um, for example, there is this famous rabbit example. Take two rabbits and they, they mate and reproduce. And these two rabbits get uh, two offspring, two young rabbits. And then after a fixed time period, each one of these two, um, I mean they mate, and then they get two young rabbits again and again. And then the number of rabbits develops like the Fibonacci sequence. There are other nice examples. There is, a, for example, there is uh, a seashell uh, with such a, it's not a shell, it's a, um, it's the housing of a snail. What's that in English? Schneckenhaus. Uh, uh, from such a sea snail. And if you look at it from top, it, it looks like a spiral. And then there are dots on it. There is some structure, and I don't remember the details, but uh, I guess in every round, so if you take a 360 degree circle, then the number of dots is Fibonacci, a Fibonacci number. And also on, on flowers, on flowers, for example, on uh, sunflowers. If you look at a sunflower, I don't know if it's true for all sunflowers, but there are types of sunflowers where uh, the seeds, they are in, uh, arranged in circles. And then I guess the number of seeds per circle also is the Fibonacci number, something like that. Huh? Okay, but actually what we do is something different. We do modular Fibonacci. So what we now do is mod m. Modular Fibonacci sequence. Now let's give us a, a trial. In order to show that this is useful, this m squared. Huh? So we do modular Fibonacci with a certain module m. Let's take m equal 3. Now, it's quite easy. We have the non-modular Fibonacci, so we, we just take all these numbers modulo 3. So it is 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 2, um, 1, 0, 1. Now let's look at this uh, sequence. Um, do we have a period already? No, no period yet. So we have to continue. Um, 0 plus 1 is 1, modulo 3 is 1. Um, now that's a period, okay? How do we detect the period here? We have to look at all pairs of numbers. So we start here and now the period is finished when we get this pair again. So that's the end of the period. And now the period is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You see, it's longer than m. It's much longer than m. It's actually m squared minus 1. <coughs> so it's even, it's even uh, maximum, almost, almost maximum. 9 would be the maximum. And here you, you really see nicely, uh, I mean the next number depends on the previous two 
And so the question is, how many combinations of two such numbers are there? Three here and three here. Three times three is nine. So that's why we have m squared as an upper bound for the period here. But be careful, it's only an upper bound. It may happen that the period is even smaller than m, and it does happen. Okay, but you can make it even better if your function f depends on three predecessors. Then, uh, as an upper bound, we get, of course, m to the third power. Why? Because among three such numbers, there are m uh, to the power three uh, combinations. And that's a proof. Very important for this proof are two things. Um, first, the, the reservoir of numbers is finite. We do have m different numbers. Huh? Okay? I mean, that's trivial. We are talking about a finite set of numbers because we apply the modular operator. The modular operator only allows us the numbers between 0 and m minus 1. That's the first ingredient. And the second is that this function f is deterministic. Yeah? Deterministic means if it depends on two arguments, whenever such a pair like this appears again, then the whole thing starts from scratch. Based on these two facts, we prove these upper bounds. And of course, if f depends on k predecessors, then m power k is the upper bound. But it's only an upper bound. Yeah. I mean, this, is, this actually doesn't make us happy. Uh, the fact that all pseudo-random number generators do have um, a finite period. But that's, it's basically a fact. Yeah. Of course, you might ask, how can I make the period longer? Even longer. Of course, this is first having such a periodic sequence. Suppose this is our pseudo random number generator and the period is 8. Then this is a source for errors in your simulations. Suppose you do some computer simulation where in your application there is a periodicity which is a multiple of 8, then this of course would lead to bad results. Yeah? Because then you get an interference between your random numbers and your application periodicity. Yeah? And of course many applications are periodic. Uh, so this is really inconvenient. We would of course like to have extremely long periods. Okay, uh, and, and I mean, years ago when I discovered this, or when I learned this, then I thought, look, I mean, how can we get longer period? By increasing the number of arguments of our f. So we would not do Fibonacci, we would do Tribonacci, which is xn is equal to xn minus 1 plus xn 
minus 2 plus xn minus 3 mod m. And of course we could improve it by adding uh, coefficients a1, a2 and a3 here and then uh, an additive constant also and then we could uh, kind of uh, explore all these possibilities and look when do we get, ma get maximum period, when do we get nice statistical properties and so on. Yeah? But then I got the idea why don't we do actually the best thing we can do which is, look, when we start with these first two numbers then we compute this one as the sum of the previous two and now when we are here we can use not only two predecessors but three and when we are here we can use all four and so on. I had this idea and, and then it might even happen that we have no periodicity because the number of arguments increases and increases and we have a different formula for computing the next number from step to step and if this formula changes maybe it's no longer deterministic and we get real random numbers. I mean that would be of course a miracle, I knew it in advance but, but I was just curious what would happen if you take just the sum of all previous numbers modulo m. And now I'll show you the result. Um, so that, that's my, the, the idea for my new formula. We, we start with some initial number and then xn is just the sum of all predecessors modulo m which may even lead to a non-periodic sequence. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if we look at this sequence and for a moment we forget the modulo like we did it here. Yeah, then what we get is this sequence. And this doesn't look perfectly random. Of course I, I already told you we need our chopping knife, the modulo. Maybe the modulo makes it random, but I mean this really doesn't look perfectly random. It's actually the powers of 2 what we get here. Huh? And why do we get the powers of 2 if we start with x0 equal to 1? Then we get 1 and the sum of 1 is 1. Sum of these two guys is 2 and then you see we have 2 plus 2 is 4 and then uh, 4 plus 4 is 8, 8 plus 4 is and so on. Yeah? So, um, oh, sorry not 8 plus 4, 8 plus 8 <coughs> is 16 and so on. So we get uh, this exponential sequence um, and uh, yeah now we, of course, we, we have this theorem, the recursively defined formula, non-modular, uh, uh, is equivalent to xn is equal to to the power n minus 1. Uh, and this can easily be proven uh, in general. For n greater than or equal to 2, that's important because for n um, less than 2, it's not true. Uh, um, I mean for this guy it's not true but for, for all other n it is true um, that xn is 2 to the power n minus 1. Um, so x1 is 2 to the power 0 and that's true. x2 is 2 to the power 1. Okay, so that's what we see here. How can we prove it? We just start with the formula xn is the sum of the predecessors and now we take the last uh, element out of the sum, xn minus 1, then the sum only goes to up to n minus 2 and now this second sum is um, this second sum here 
is equal to x n minus 1. Why? Why is this x n minus 1? Oh, you are looking at this example, yes, but this is not a proof. I mean, you are telling me I believe it, uh, but this is not religion, it's mathematics. And now we are in the proof. Or did I misunderstand you? No. Okay. Why is this equal to xn minus 1? Yeah, because it's, it's defined like that. Look, this is the definition of xn. Now replace in this de definition n by n minus 1. Then we get xn minus 1 is equal to the sum i equal 0 to n minus 2 xi. And I mean, that's this. Okay? And this laptop gets tired. Oh, it has 25%, so no problem. Okay, so this is equal to xn minus 1, so we get xn minus 1 plus xn minus 1, which is 2 times xn minus 1. And I mean, this is actually the functional equation for the, for the powers of 2. Um, so we see that xn is equal to 2 to the power n minus 1, if we use um, x0 equal 1. Huh? I did not prove this. I mean, it, actually you see it when you look at this. If you don't see it, just prove this by induction. It's a really nice and trivial induction proof. Nice exercise for induction proof to prove that if you have this equation and you start with x0 equal 1, then you get xn is equal to 2 to power n minus 1. It's a nice and easy induction proof. I don't do it now. Okay, now we have shown that for the non-modular sequence where we take xn as the sum of all predecessors, then we get this exponential series. Okay. Now, since we have proven this, we can immediately apply this to the modular sequence. So, if xn is the sum of the predecessors modulo m, then of course this is 2 to the power n minus 1 modulo m. And now we are finished. Now we have shown that our modular sequence cannot have an arbitrarily long period. Why not? Why not? I mean, we see now this, so xn is equal to 2 to the power n minus 1 modulo m. What can you now say about the period of our sequence? Yeah, here it's written. The period is uh, bounded by m. Why? That's trivial. That's really simple. And it is because of this theorem. If we have a function which depends on only one predecessor, then m is an upper bound for the period. And you see that basically our um, congruence generator only depends on n minus 1. Huh?
Oh, I mean, yeah, actually this... Uh, so it, it, it looks like it does not depend on, uh, on some predecessor. But of course, with this formula here, we know that this is equal to... Sorry, it is equal to 2 times xn minus 1 mod m. And now you see, it depends on one predecessor. That's it. Yeah, so actually I should add this to the script. Isn't that nice mathematics? It's just beautiful. Okay, yeah. Now let's continue talking about how to test the quality of pseudo-random or no, how to test the how to test randomness of arbitrary sequences. Yeah? You are given um, a pipe where bits are flowing out. Yeah? So this is again the picture. There is this water hose, and but of course it doesn't deliver water, it gives you bits. It's like testing the water quality. Yeah, it's kind of similar. And it has to do with statistics. I mean the TWS Technische Werke Schussenthal on their website they publish chemical results about the water quality in Weingarten, in Ravensburg and so on. And then it says there is so much phosphate and so much uh, lead and whatever in the water. But can you be sure that in your house you have this quality? No! It's just statistical and it's a statistical induction. I mean, they make this test last year and you hope that there is no change this year. And the same problem is what we have here. Look, I mean, this, um, this pipe delivers infinitely many bits. But you have no chance to look at all infinitely many bits. No chance. You can just look at maybe one million bits you get today. And then you store them on your computer. You look at the quality of these one million bits. And then you do statistical induction and hope that in the future the bits that come out here will have similar quality. That's a serious problem. We already saw this problem when we talked about Kolmogorov complexity. It's the same thing. That's one of the reasons why it is impossible to measure the Kolmogorov complexity. Because you never will see the whole infinite sequence. You only see a finite prefix of the sequence. You can make it very long, you can say I use a billion of bits. Still it's only finite. For example, what may happen is you look at one million bits and the period may be exactly one million. You don't see it. You have no chance to see that this sequence is periodic if you have only one million bits. And if you would have two million bits, still you couldn't prove that the period is one million. Let's talk about this. Yeah, let's take an example again. Let's take a sequence uh, of um, 
um, decimal digits. So we just uh, have the numbers 0 through 9. And then we have the sequence, let's start with 8, 2, 5, 3, 7, 8, 2, 5. That's what you see. Now you would immediately say, maybe, I don't know, this sequence is periodic. That's what we see. Huh? But now you turn on the pipe again and then you get a 1 here. And you see it's not periodic. Even if it looks like you have seen three, three periods, like 3, 7, 8, 2, 5, 3, 7, 8. You don't know what comes next. You may have a 1 here and a 0. You cannot guarantee, even if it looks like it's perfectly periodic, you don't know. I mean, maybe there is God behind and he thro throws a dice, whatever. Huh? That's a problem. I mean, you only have a finite prefix and you can do statistical induction, but there is no guarantee. That's a problem we have, but we have to live with this problem. I mean, and we, we can live quite good with this problem. I mean, we still take water in our house, even though Technische Welke Schussenthal didn't test the water this morning. It was one year ago. Okay, yeah. Um, now this is the question. How to test the symmetry? So, remember, what is a random number generator? Uh, a random bit generator? The bits have to be symmetric and statistically independent. So forget for a moment statistical independence. Let's talk about symmetry. What does symmetry mean? What does symmetry of bits mean? Please, I mean, this is really basic. Every digit? What do you mean with every digit? Um, number or whatever. Yeah, we're talking about bits. Bit in this case. Okay. Yeah. And that means basically the number of ones and the number of zeros have to be um, equal, often. equal. Okay? Are you sure? Would you all agree? My sequence can only be random if the number of zeros and the number of ones is identical. Would you agree with that? I hope no. Because if this happens all the time, then you can be quite sure that this sequence is not random. Then you can be quite sure there is somebody who manipulates behind the pipe. Because if this sequence is really random, then there is some random noise. Then, I mean, if you have a million bits, would you expect 500,000 ones and 500,000 zeros? Would you expect this? No, you would not. You would not. You would expect some random noise. And this is the interesting question and that's how we will next time design a test for symmetry, a statistical test. And the question is how much deviation of this number 0.5, so 50% once, how much deviation of this number is allowed and how much deviation is too much? Yeah? That's the question. Yeah? We will talk about this next time. Thank you.